Thank you for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Coming up, the future of University City, an update on the debate between homeowners and renters on how to boost density and what's become a thriving hub for business. A major honor for an educator in the South Bay. See some of the work that's earned him a spot in the National Teachers Hall of Fame. And wolves in San Diego County are on the move. An update on their journey from a local sanctuary to a zoo in Chicago. Well, San Diego leaders are taking new action to address homelessness. Melissa May tells us about plans for a new shelter that would be the largest in the city. When the city of San Diego passed the unsafe camping ordinance in 2023, a promise of more safe housing opportunities was made. Mayor Todd Gloria says he is following through with this promise. I'm announcing my administration's plan to create the city of San Diego's largest ever homeless shelter for people experiencing homelessness that will have capacity for up to 1,000 people to get off the streets and connect it to care. The proposed shelter is a 65,000 square foot warehouse at the intersection of Kettner Boulevard and Vine Street. San Diego City Council member Stephen Whitburn describes the amenities planned for the site. There will be a full kitchen that will be providing prepared meals to the people who are staying here. Uh, there will be an outdoor play area for people's pets that they are welcome to bring to this location. Uh, there will be supportive services on site for people. Uh, there will be case managers here that will help connect people to housing. Donnie D with the San Diego Rescue Mission says they are excited about the proposal especially if it's offering more than just beds. If they're going to take that piece of it seriously, where they're actually addressing the issues of the heart on an individual basis, then I believe they can actually move people out of the facility into living life again. And if that's their vision and if that's their plan, then two thumbs up, five stars. D says they haven't received any details about the shelter plan, but they want to be at the table as those details are worked out. And he says the community needs to be involved, too. Uh, when you open up facilities, there's people in those communities that aren't going to want it. So you're going to have to communicate with them. Community opposition is one of the issues with another shelter plan from the city, the H Barracks Project off North Harbor Drive. Gloria says if the Kettner facility is approved by the city council, the H Barracks site would become part of the city's safe parking program with 200 spaces for people living in their vehicles. There are no details yet on what converting the Kettner site will cost, but Gloria says the funding will come from state grants, the city's general fund, and local philanthropy. Dee hopes the shelter can offer long-term help that meets people where they are. You start treating people like people, they'll start acting like people again. And so way to go, city, for taking a risk, doing something on a large scale, and trying to change our homeless problem that we have here in San Diego County. The shelter proposal is set to be presented to a city council committee on April 18th. Melissa May, KPBS News. San Diego's affordability crisis means many people struggle to live near their workplace. University City is one of those neighborhoods where density isn't keeping up with demand. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says there is an update to the community plan that hopes to meet the needs of renters and homeowners. University City is a major employment hub, but the neighborhood has nowhere near enough housing to accommodate its workforce, meaning most people who work there have to commute long distances. The University Community Plan update envisions more dense apartment buildings, some of the densest housing outside of downtown, especially around the neighborhood's six trolley stations. UCSD student Leanna Cortez says that's more sustainable and inclusive than the status quo. We have the UC San Diego Blue Line now connected in University City, which I feel like has been a great investment. And so I think this plan really capitalizes on that by having development oriented near those options, which from a student perspective and just like a young professional um, University City perspective, I think it allows a lot of people that have been priced out um, of University City to potentially like come back. The draft zoning plan still restricts most of the south of the neighborhood to single-family homes. That was a concession to homeowners who fiercely opposed a proposal to allow townhomes in the area. 
The city is proposing to allow apartment buildings up to 100 feet in two areas of Southern University City. The volunteer group Help Save UC had hoped for stricter regulations on density, height, and parking. The group told KPBS in a statement, quote, Help Save UC is disappointed that the city appears to have rejected all of our proposals after several years of engagement despite claiming to desire community input. Cortez says many UCSD students were excluded from the planning process. We try to humanize uh, the struggle of students as well. Um, oh my God. We and shouted down and dismissed at community meetings that were dominated by homeowners. The public has until April 29th to comment on the draft University Community Plan update. You can find it at planuniversity.org. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. KPBS is exploring mental health in schools with a series of reports from Katie Heisen. She recently visited a school in El Cajon to see how they're addressing the issue head on with their curriculum. Ehe charter school students, kindergarten through eighth grade, play in the schoolyard. Buenos dias! Good morning! Principal Ariana Gonzalez gives the morning message. Today, it's about self-discipline. The students discuss. So over here, we're going to have Solana share out what is self-discipline. At Eje, students learn these social-emotional skills every day. It's baked into the curriculum. In Jennifer Turner's third grade classroom, they circle up to share what color they're feeling that day. One student says he's in the blue zone. Yeah, I'm tired. You can see blue. Oh, you didn't have a good night's sleep? No. Salise Gonzalez is in the yellow zone. It's like a little bit in the yellow zone because I feel silly. You feel a little bit silly? They talk about what they can do to get into the green zone, calm and ready to learn. The whole class decides to take a brain break and dance. <laughs> Elise tells me she likes circle time. Because I like to talk about my emotions, and I also like to listen to other children's emotions to support them. I ask her what she does when the emotions feel big. There's this place called Safe Zone where, like, if you're, like, feeling, like, really sad or something, you can, like, sit there, and you can just, like, calm down there and, like, calm down yourself, and so then... When, you're, when you feel calm, then you can just come back and start learning. Turner also teaches tools like asking yourself, how big is your problem? And the third graders use them, even on her. I came in and I told the students, like, I'm really frustrated because my car got towed and, you know, I was really angry. And they're like, how big is that problem? Is someone in, like, is someone in danger? And I was like, no, you know, it can be solved. <laughs> Salise's mom, Melissa Gonzalez, says Salise brings these tools home with her. Her ability to articulate her emotions has improved a lot. And she can sit down and talk and um, sometimes go on and on a while about how she's feeling, which is really good. At Eje, social emotional learning looks different at different ages. They've incorporated an entire middle school class on managing stress. <laughs> To manage stress in, your life. in Cyan Fairley's eighth grade classroom, they brainstorm what they're most stressed about and how they might handle it. Jalen Maldenga saying writes that she's most stressed about social media, tests, Fortnite, and what she calls drama. To cope, she might go for a jog, talk to someone, or take some deep breaths. I'm definitely uh, focusing on my breathing and um, how to stop that stress, and that really helps me while I'm doing my homework. Research backs what Jalen is describing, that social-emotional learning improves academic performance and other things, too, like attendance and behavior in class. Fairley doesn't think of it as something extra she's asked to do as a teacher, but as a foundation of teaching. It may seem like a lot, but I think it's totally worth it, and I can't expect my student to be in the class and willing to participate and to learn if they're not well. She says the need for social emotional learning became even more apparent during COVID. Because they were at home, they didn't really get to see their friends. They had classes over Zoom, but it wasn't the same. The school created a new role, Dean of School Culture, and hired Paulina Isidro. 
I ask her how common this kind of social emotional curriculum is in schools. Overall, this is a trend that we're seeing in education, um, but here at Eje, I think that we, the reason why this school was born and built was truly um, for that, for supporting students that were historically um, not served. Concerned parents created the school 30 years ago. Schools in the area were being shut down because of low performance. But she says the real issue was a lack of bilingual education. Many of the displaced students were Spanish speaking. Eje's eighth graders, like Jalen, will have to bring all their tools to their new schools next year to overcome the racial disparities that remain. The neighboring district, San Diego Unified, failed to graduate Hispanic students at a rate three times that of white students. Oh, oh, oh. Katie Heisen, KPBS News. A teacher from the Sweetwater Union High School District has just been named to the National Teachers Hall of Fame. KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez takes us to the classroom where he makes music and inspires students every day. Taking time to tune up is important for these students here at Southwest Middle School, less than a few miles from the Mexican border. There's a hum in the room as they make music that is markedly mariachi. Their teacher is Keith Ballard, who has spent the last 25 years creating cultural music programs that have spread to other campuses in the Sweetwater Union High School District and beyond bringing him national recognition for supporting students from marginalized communities looking to break a cycle of poverty and succeed academically. If you just give them a little bit of love and you work hard and you show them some compassion, you can do some great things. And he has. His dedication, innovation, and adventurous spirit make him a true asset to the teaching profession. Keith, on behalf of the National Teachers Hall of Fame, I welcome you as a 2024 inductee. Ballard is one of only five teachers nationwide named to the National Hall of Fame this year. Mr. Ballard will be doing some traveling before the end of the school year, first to Washington, D.C., to visit with officials from the Department of Education, and then on to Emporia, Kansas, known as Teacher Town. That's because it's the home of the National Teachers Hall of Fame, which will host the induction ceremony in June. Emporia State University also houses the National Memorial to Fallen Educators, a permanent tribute to teachers who lost their lives in the line of duty. I feel privileged, I feel honored, but I feel more honored, and I mean this from, from the bottom of my heart, to be a teacher here at Southwest middle school. His students are honored to have his trust. Is a really um, straightforward teacher. Um, he he tell he be he's honest. He's honest. And now he's on his way to the Hall of Fame for making music matter. MG Perez, KPBS News. Artist Tara Arunsakul has a new solo exhibit on view in Logan Heights. It's an immersive maze that explores assimilation, the American dream, and racism. KPBS arts producer and editor Julia Dixon Evans takes us through the exhibit. With the sunlight behind it, Tara Arunsakul's massive suspended maze grows white and nearly translucent. A closer look reveals all sorts of strange, found objects affixed to the white panels. There's tea bags, there's dried ramen noodles, there's human hair. But from afar, it looks ethereal and delicate. I wanted to build an interactive maze. I think that's something that I've learned since I was in high school is um, given a canvas or any space is to take as much of it as possible and create as much of it as possible. The maze takes up plenty of space at the Athenaeum Art Center in Logan Heights. And that crisp, delicate white material is mostly toilet seat covers and tissue. The objects woven into and stuck to the maze represent assimilation, particularly for Asian immigrants and their families, and the balance they have to strike between pursuing a fragile, misleading American dream and hanging on to pieces of home. Arunsakul wants visitors to experience the unsettling conflict and disorientation of assimilation within the maze. And food is an undeniable part of the immigrant experience, anchoring families to both old and new lands. Food also serves to bring the art to a level that's easier to understand. 
I think that food is something that everyone can relate to. It's all over the maze. There's like some Lay's chips here that have like, it's Thai Lay's chips and it's things that we can identify with, but there's a lot of influence of every culture in every culture, I think. Nothing comes from nowhere. Arinsico wanted the maze to speak to how susceptible American society is to racism in her own experience as a first generation Thai Lao American. Essentially it's about um, structural racism and uh, personally speaking from my experience is uh, the assimilation of Asian culture into uh, you know, white American society and what that means for each narrative. And so each sheet in this uh, maze kind of represents that. As visitors make their way through the maze, they'll see more prominent tufts of hair and even plastic cockroaches. Arun Sokol wanted to explore how anti-blackness has historically thrived in Asian American communities. She knew this could mean a ramped up sense of discomfort. The hair you see here is sort of, um, I think it represents a lot of different things in different cultures, but I definitely think that hair is something that we all try to maintain um, in some certain way. So um, that kind of represents an anti-blackness too, is like something that we always have to check ourselves on. Tucked away within the maze are some altar-like groupings. There's loose white rice and sculptures on the floor with suspended sculptures hanging above them. These groupings were inspired by the formation of rock in caves and the way minerals are redeposited and they interrupt the flow of the maze. Structural racism um, sort of goes unseen um, unless you're confronted with it directly or affected by it. Irene Sokol shares a North Park studio space with a handful of other artists. There, works in progress hang alongside previous sculptures, like a life-size pig carcass constructed from paper. Her studio is tidy but bursting with creativity and color. When asked how she knows her work is complete, she reflects on the process of making the maze panel by panel, 48 giant panels in total. When it's done, it'll tell me, because if I just keep on working on one the whole time, I will never be done with it. Christopher Padilla manages the Athenaeum Art Center Gallery and curated the exhibition. He said that Arun Sokol's art is both alluring and in your face. It was nice to be able to bring it in here and just blow it up to a scale where you are forced as a viewer to essentially walk through a massive piece. As unsettling as some of the installation is, the beauty in Arun Sokol's work is not unintentional and it's not beside the point. I think that a lot of people need things to be um, sort of picturesque so they could digest it a little bit more. And I think that more pur my purpose of this uh, installation is so people could be engulfed and feel comfortable enough. Like I said, I use household items so people would be more open-minded to step in. Julia Dixon Evans, KPBS News. And the exhibit is on display now through May 3rd. For more stories like this one, check out our Spring Arts Guide there. You'll find our picks for the best arts and culture in San Diego, including visual art, theater, dance, music, and literature, and even some picks for kids. Just go to kpbs.org slash Spring Arts Guide. Clowning, acrobatics, tightrope, and many more circus acts are coming to public parks across San Diego. Jacob Ayer says a social circus looks to tell stories through free events that reach across generations and cultures. The circus is back in action. Fern Street Circus, that is. The arts organization is kicking off its annual neighborhood tour with 10 public bilingual performances at community parks and rec centers around San Diego. Catalina Paz, or Abuelita, is the show's creator and director. We're going to have juggling, unicycle, break dancing. We're going to have a sear wheel. We're going to have contortion. The shows include young students from Fern Street Circus's free after-school program in City Heights, and elementary school residency programs in Imperial Beach. Fifth grader Isabella Estrada has been in the program for three years. I do acrobatics, flexibility, and some juggling. She's one of the stars of the show. It's fun because you get to express who you are and be yourself and motivate people to actually like get out of the bubble and be themselves. From Mid-City to San Isidro, the events will showcase professional circus artists and musicians from around the world. The neighborhood tour also offers free community health fairs 
and pre-show mariachi concerts. Fern Street Circus General Manager Marcela Mercado stumbled upon the circus eight years ago. It was really magical when I saw the kids laughing and enjoying themselves and I was like, I want my kids to feel the same way. So we decided to join. After more than 30 years in San Diego, this year's show, called Home, has an extra special meaning. The organization recently moved into its first ever dedicated indoor space at the former Central Elementary School building in City Heights. This is the first time that the circus has an actual physical space that we can call home. So that's why um, we're so excited to be part of this um, building and have an indoor space. While the events can explore more serious subjects, Paz says the main goal is to laugh and have some stress-free fun. <laughs> All good. We forget about playtime, right? And playtime is for everybody, for kids, for adults, for senior citizens like me, even for your pets. The circus performances take place at 2 p.m. each Saturday and Sunday, now through May 5th, rain or shine, thanks to their new home. For those looking to clown around, more information is available at fernstreetcircus.com. Don't try it at home. If you try it at home... La La Chonka! Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. You just gotta love her. Well, this week, the California Wolf Center and Julian sent three of their male wolves to Chicago's Brookfield Zoo. It's part of the captive management program that's helped Mexican gray wolves rebound from near extinction. SciTech reporter Thomas Fudge visited the center and has this story. There are 23 Mexican gray wolves that live at the California Wolf Center spread across 50 acres in Julian. It may seem like plenty of room, but when males get to be one and a half years old, the place gets kind of crowded. Sierra McIsaac says the males become independent and get the itch to leave and start their own pack, a process called dispersal. And we have a pack of wolves where they are, uh, it is mom and dad and seven boys. Uh, and so these, these brothers are starting to have a little bit of tension, but what's really awesome is we are able to have that natural dispersal. That's where the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago comes in. McIsaac, the wolf care coordinator at the Wolf Center, says Brookfield has opened up what she calls a wonderful habitat space. And this week they're going to send three wolves there to imitate the natural process of dispersal of young males. And they're going to be going to Brookfield Zoo, which is really exciting. The California Wolf Center in Julian is part of a nationwide system they call the Mexican Wolf Safe Program. It's a captive breeding program that has brought the species back from the brink of extinction. Teresa Cozen is the executive director of the Wolf Center. She says in the 1970s, their count in the American Southwest got down to 13 in the wild. But recent counts by U.S. Fish and Wildlife have brought much better news. Today, there are at least 257 Mexican gray wolves in the U.S. About 40% of them are collared, so there's usually one collared wolf in every pack in the wild. So they use that collar to track them, and then they can do a count of how many we have in the wild. Two years ago, their count increased 23 percent. Last year's census showed it was up another 6 percent. Their habitat is the American Southwest. There are some, but many fewer, in Mexico. Conservation groups increase wild populations with protection programs. They also cross-foster wolf pups born in captivity with pups born in the wild. So let's say we were selected to breed, we would be watching our female, and the moment that we know that she has had puppies, we will contact U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Mexican Wolf Safe Program, and say, okay, we've had puppies on May 1st. And then they will look at all their wild packs and see if there is a mom out in the wild who's had puppies. If there is a wild den with puppies born right about the same time, the captive pups will be moved there quickly and carefully. They'll be scent marked to match the wild pups and placed in the den when the adult wolves are absent. 
When the wolves return. Uh, it is uh, the slogan of the cross fostering program that mom can't count. Uh, and so there they go, they're out in the wild. Uh, and what's really awesome is wolves are very well known for adopting. The management of the endangered Mexican gray wolf in captivity boils down to breeding, introducing pups to the wild, and transferring animals, like the ones going to the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. Hopefully, in the end, that means wild populations will continue to increase. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. And four coyote pups were recently turned over to the San Diego Humane Society after they were discovered under the deck of a home in Pacific Beach. Alexander Wynn has details on what you should do if you encounter coyote pups in the wild. Workers marked fed and weighed the pups before they were taken to the Humane Society's Project Wildlife Program in Ramona. The coyote breeding season is late January through early March. The Humane Society says they will be raised in captivity until they're old enough to be released in the wild. What are you doing? Hi. Andy Blue is the campus director for the Humane Society's Ramona Wildlife Center. He says workers take great care in not getting the pups used to human presence. They wear masks and furs with coyote scent on them when feeding the pups. They begin to learn her, her scent. The furs are donated, and the scent comes from Brawley, <coughs> the center's ambassador coyote. She helps teach the public about coyotes and their behaviors. Blue says it's not unusual for pups to be left alone during the day because both parents are out hunting. It is rare, but if you do see them in the wild, he says it's best to leave them be. We all have good intentions and we think we should we should pick it up and bring it to Project Wildlife. But in most cases, you can call us and we can we can kind of advise you on, on the best way to go with that. And with the parents out hunting, there might be increased sightings of coyotes. Blue says not to worry. Well, Brawley here is used to humans, but experts say if you see them in the wild, they're more afraid of you than you are of them. If you see them, there's also really good ways to what we call haze coyotes. If you're carrying a, an air horn or even some keys, you can make some sort of racket, some sort of noise if you're walking, and that seems to scare them off. Coyotes are everywhere in San Diego, so it's not unusual to see them out and about, even during the day. Alexander Nguyen, KPBS News. And we hope that you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Thanks for joining us.